And if, as if by magic, we are live on the air. Hello, Chris. Hey, Chris. Hey, hey world. Hello, everyone. Emory University. So I, I shared in the tweet, I said, uh, I, I did a, a slash higher ed. Is that, a, is that an appropriate hashtag for higher ed? Do people use that? Yep. You bet they do. Very cool. So if you could tell me a little bit about you both and then do your presentation, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I have been uh, with Emory University for the last three and a half years. I started out, well, I still am an IT service management specialist, but when I began my journey here at Emory, uh, it was in the realm of handling all of the service operations processes and uh, really heavily focused on incident and problem. And through that journey or that section of my journey was really the, uh, the highlight of my career around implementing incident management and bringing together 19 of 25 organizations within Emory. So uh, a lot to share about creating, delivering, and sustaining value and organizational change management. And now I belong to the PMO as an implant uh, to kind of bridge together service management and project management. So very, very exciting times for me. Okay, so basically uh, 800 people just decided they wanted to hire you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, m Mr. Mark. Yes, Mark Kawasaki here. I'm an IT service management specialist with the IT service management office. Uh, I work in a lot of different areas, uh, you know, bringing departments together under common processes, obviously. Uh, work a lot on configuration management, availability and events, some of those more geeky ones, and uh, also service level management, uh, working with uh, different business units with that. And uh, love it here. Nice. All right, so if you guys don't want to go ahead and share your screen, as soon as we're up and running, uh, I will go ahead and um, disappear, and you can go ahead and present. Thanks, Chris. Awesome. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We're going to be talking about ITSM and the service of humanity, as you can see there. Uh, there's our Twitter handles if you want to tweet us. Uh, so before we get started with the slides, I'd, I'd like to start us off with a story. Uh, it's a story about a janitor that worked for NASA in the 1960s. So as, an, as the NASA program was gearing up for, you know, the big lunar mission, uh, there was lots of press around. And, and one of the reporters saw a janitor and asked him, what is your job here? And the janitor looked at him and without a pause said, my job is to put a man on the moon, which is a pretty interesting answer for a janitor. Uh, that story is often used. You may have heard it before in, in ITSM training presentations and the like. It's used to illustrate how services you know, support business outcomes. The janitor service adds to the value chain that eventually resulted in the first you know, human step onto the moon. But what's more interesting to me today is not really what the janitor said, it's how he came to say it. How was he able to connect to the higher goal of putting a man on the moon? Who was it that guided this man to the rather grand view of his own value? I don't even know if the story is true or what the answers to those questions are, but somehow I, I don't really imagine that there was some kind of janitor campaign to get them aligned with the business outcome of getting a man on the moon there must have been some kind of overarching business campaign within NASA that was organized to rally every single resource toward a common outcome. Um, here at Emory, we're lucky because we, we work for an organization that does this pretty well. This message you see on the screen is from Emory's President Wagner, uh, and it came in the form of, of an email not long after I started working at the university when I read it, I was a bit overwhelmed because it struck me that uh, I realized that this is why I came to Emory. I, I wanted to be part of this. And he says, my hope is that we as students, educators, staff, scholars, researchers, and healers are able to see more immediate significance and meaning in what we do every day as members of the Emory community. What we do makes a difference in the world. So what we're talking about there is business value that turns into social value and goes all the way to personal value for employees here at Emory, and that's that's really special. I think everyone is capable of some degree of that in their organization. It's just a matter of thinking of it in those terms and finding it. Um, so 
the janitor story is amazing, not because it's a, a model of good ITSM, but rather it reminds us that experiencing personal value in our work can make any job worthwhile. But in IT, how do we get a piece of that? How do we stay informed of the business outcomes? How do we make them our own? You know, Emory is a huge place with 11 different schools, a healthcare business, multiple hospitals and clinics, research divisions, hundreds of millions of dollars in grants and contracts. So a couple years ago, as a new employee feeling kind of overwhelmed by the vastness of Emory and how I might possibly begin to be able to help create services that support business outcomes, I just started to look around. What I found was that the business was talking quite a lot about their outcomes. There's websites, newsletters, press releases, public events, open houses, you name it. Uh, the business is not shy about declaring the value that is being achieved or provided. There's uh, grants and contracts, projects in play, working toward the goal of achieving new outcomes. This slide here shows just two examples of uh, the kinds of things that can be found every day here at Emory. I'm sure the same applies to your organization if you look around the businesses uh, celebrating their accomplishments, they have initiatives in play that you can find out about. Um, so it's been a while now that IT has been talking about aligning themselves with the business, but too often it seems like the business value uh, is kind of kept within the business. It's almost hoarded by the business, it seems. They don't share it with IT. They try to solution things before they talk to us. We come up with IT services based on what we think they want, but obviously that's not enough. So then it... In ITSM, we started talking about partnering with the business. This is a tweet by Chris York that says, uh, when designing solutions, don't ask people what they want. They can't tell you. Immerse yourself in problem solve and then create a solution. So that's interesting because that's, that's much more partnering, not just throwing things over the fence and hoping that the business can do something with it. Uh, it's working to create services together with the business, putting yourselves in their shoes. Uh, so that we can provide real value. Still, I think, I think even beyond that, we, we need more. I know I wanted more. There's another level of uh, integration with the business that's more customer-centric, what we call outside-in uh, and having a focus on the customer or rather the consumer. Our customer used to be the business. Now the end customer can belong to everyone. So for myself, in the summer of this year, I decided that I needed to get out there. I, I, what I did is I did an experiment where I gave up my office for 30 days and went fully mobile around campus. That's something I could do because there's like 3,000 and some wireless access points around campus. Uh, but I ended up working just about anywhere in different departments, libraries, student centers, cafeterias around campus. I was able to observe you know, students working lectures, I watch faculty use technology or attempt to use uh, technology. I actually use the IT services myself that we provide uh, and I even experienced major incidents along with the customers. I listened to them talk about the major incidents as they were occurring. And the thing is I loved this experience so much that I never moved back into my office. I'm still doing it today. I love it. I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I encourage you to think about that. How often do you spend time observing your end customers? If you're in retail, do you spend time in stores or uh, you know, do you work with the products that you actually sell? All those things and then thinking beyond that, what value are they providing to customers uh, and how does that relate to value to society and to, um, to your own personal value? Okay, um, I loved Matt's last presentation he just gave, Matt Hooper. This is a, this is a quote he, he gave that's right in line with this presentation. IT is not a department, it's a competency. You should be teaching and raising the level of competency in all the business operations about how information flows. And that to me is, again, taking it even further to another level where you're out there with the business, but you're actually teaching them to think in terms of how they can use information and how they can make it flow. I've seen business units you know, export information from an application, hand it off to someone else who then types it back into the application. I mean, they don't 
even sometimes know that they don't have to do that. You have to you have to enable them by by helping them raise their own awareness of what te technology can do for themselves. And that's uh, that's what I see here as a term in terms of maturity and the relationship to the business. This is what we're trying to achieve beyond alignment, even through partnership, to integrating with the business to the point of what I like to call assimilation, where IT and the business actually take on qualities of the other. So they can be more technology minded and IT can actually be more business minded and participate in some of the uh, selling aspects of the services that we provide, the business services that we provide. Thanks, Mark. So uh, I think Mark does a great job of tying together some great concepts and thoughts about how to be more attuned or aligned with that customer outside in approach. And, and you know, one of the benefits of being a part of a university is that it's completely natural for us to pull from several different frameworks and practices and you know, be in that creative space to say what can we utilize from different pieces of, of guidance and frameworks that, that are out there and how can we apply it. So I wanted to share a little bit about what we've done in our journey in applying uh, pieces of these practices. So uh, the first one I kind of wanted to, to give a shout out to Karen Ferris who's one of, uh, I consider to be uh, her one of my mentors. But she's the author of Balanced Diversity, and she utilizes research that's been conducted by Dr. Bertels, Lisa, and Daniel Papnia to help frame this portfolio approach to organizational change. And um, without delving into too much details of the framework, um, it really revolves around uh, dimensions of intent and approach and breaks up 59 practices into quadrants that balance between fulfillment where practices are targeted at delivering on current commitments or implementing certain initiatives um, and innovation where you have practices that are targeted at delivering innova uh, innovation, a better or different way of doing things. And what's interesting about this is that it's a great tool for us because we use this uh, at Emory to conduct a gap analysis because we recognize that a project would not be a project unless it's unique in most cases. And so if a project is unique, then there must be a unique approach to how that change is going to be delivered, how the value is going to be realized, and who our audiences are, and what different artifacts and tools we can use to communicate the change, to, you know, generate that excitement for it. Um, we pull from the ADCAR framework and actually one of our biggest goals over the last year as a part of the PMO was to come up with a formal change, organizational change management strategy that we can embed into our project life cycle. So we utilized a, you know, the, the balanced portfolio approach as a tool for a gap analysis. We've used ADCAR to kind of uh, you know, integrate a, a conscious awareness of what it is that we need to think of when we're looking at elements of change around creating awareness and desire. Uh, and so on and so forth. And then we pull uh, activities that are suggested within the guidance that ITIL provides under service transition, uh, chapter four, if anyone's interested in, in reading up on that. That was my little ITIL geek moment. Um, and uh, the ABCs of ICT, which uh, is a great little card deck, and it's amazing what a, a card deck and a book of exercises can do for an organization because it starts such an amazing conversation. It can help highlight potential challenges and behaviors and attitudes that exist within your team. And so we've used all of these frameworks to really uh, bring together what our approach is. And so we've had some success in how we try to use this in, in the way that we deliver um, our value through the, the services and programs and projects we put into play. And, and we have some areas of improvement as well. Um, what I wanted to kind of zoom in on this morning, afternoon, whatever night it is for you who are watching out there around the globe, I wanted to zoom in on what we do, um, just a few of these practices. So the practices I wanted to zoom in on are around what's um, informally being done to foster commitment within the organization, whether it is to IT service management or the new services and products that we put out um, through projects. 
And so, um, you know, there's some activities around investing in our community, for example. And um, Mark demonstrated an excellent example by going out there and becoming one with the customer, so to speak, by actively uh, being involved in the campus and around the campus and, and being a user of these services. So another example here is our deputy CIO sent an email uh, out to the entire IT division. And um, what I loved about this is that he totally allowed, um, as, a, as a leader, the investment in the community and recognized the importance of that, where he said that, you know, we should connect with the academic life of Emory. And our jobs are not just to go to meetings or, or apply a patch to a server or upgrade a switch. Um, we should be getting out and discovering all that a tw top 20 university has to offer. Uh, and that's really how you generate excitement or help help that janitor connect with a message around putting a man on the moon, for example. Um, and he said, you know, go uh, get out of your offices and find your favorite place to ca on campus to work. Um, and, you know, really try to, to foster that journey or the importance of, of you know, going out there and experiencing everything that you have to offer. And I think Mark really uh, tied that up with his taking it a step further and, and going mobile. Um, in terms of another method, so uh, the one of the other practices was around educating. So um, one of the most uh, significant projects we did last year was an upgrade to our learning management system, uh, which was uh, Blackboard here at the university. And I mean, there were so many exciting things about this upgrade. And so I, I think that one of the great things that we have is the dedicated marketing and communication specialists within IT that help drive the message of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And this is just one example of um, posters. We, we do a lot of posters that kind of are dispersed throughout campus that talk about what it is we're delivering. What's interesting about this poster is that I think um, it's, it's very visually attractive and it has all the right elements of marketing, but the question I have is does it really drive to the outcomes that we're going to deliver? And that can be hard. And so, uh, like I mentioned, I think we've taken great strides forward in starting to do some of this, and I think we still have uh, quite a ways to go. I mean, the Blackboard upgrade gave us the ability to um, have a class, a faculty member who's teaching a class on contemporary history of the Middle East, and and integrate a video from Cairo or introduce uh, slideshows to students from around the world through SlideShare or, or you know, using Flickr, what, what have you. So a lot of integration capability, a lot of collaborative capability was introduced um, through this project. So having the posters and the marketing is a great way to educate uh, your users as well as your internal IT folks on what you're doing. Um, another exciting, uh, I guess, artifact or method that we use to educate is through our IT newsletters, and they're all available publicly. You can search for them um, by going to it.emory.edu. But what's exciting is that um, they they love to educate. We've we've loved to educate not only our um, IT folks but the world on what we're doing with some of that technology and how it's made an impact. So our Center for Interactive Teaching uh, is a great example of a true partnership and assimilation in many ways between the business and IT. Um, this particular venture allowed collaboration between uh, groups in England and uh, those who are here at Emory and um, allowed for them to use video conferencing technology to bring a virtual classroom together. And our business school was so, uh, I guess, amazed or, or excited about this particular capability that uh, the project team, the IT project team, was invited to create a module for the executive MBA program. So right there, for the IT folks, how exciting is it that your work will be forever, or for a very long period of time anyway, ingrained directly in a curriculum that impacts thousands and thousands of students each year. It's pretty remarkable. Um, one of, uh, another one of our big success stories and, and another element or practice that uh, is a part of the framework in the portfolio approach is around follow-up and recognition. And I think this is huge and, and it really helps. And it could be recognition through project awards um, or in this case applying for industry 
industry awards. So our AMCOM project, which was an upgrade to our paging system, won project of the year. What was cool about it is not only the success metrics, but what those metri metrics meant for the organization and how all of the members within the IT project team understood that big picture. So, you know, they were able to reduce major incidents by 25% for the on-call calendar and paging system. They were able to decrease the emergency notification message throughput time by 45% through this upgrade. And they were able to create a fully redundant system in distinct geographic locations and then reduce database failover uh, from one site to another from 30 minutes to a few seconds. But what everybody understood and focused on is that doing this upgrade meant the difference between life or death for our patient care. So um, those few seconds, every second count. So a huge success to be able to um, accomplish some of these things throughout this uh, project. Um, some of the more formal practices that we have around um, fulfillment and clarifying expectations um, include <clears throat> the creation of new roles, looking at training and developing metrics. From an IT service management perspective in our program here that we've implemented, uh, it's, it's exciting. We have 13 ITIL experts within our uh, IT organization here at Emory. Um, we have almost everybody in OIT on the, uh, on the university technology services side with, uh, trained with their foundations certification. Um, what's remarkable about, that, remarkable about that is that it allowed us to really get people excited on the same level of terminology. Um, and then we invited people to have a voice. And so a lot of decisions and things are done in a higher ed environment through consensus and collaboration. And it's always been like that. So what was interesting is um, IT has not necessarily always traditionally been collaborative and consensus based. So these are some of the challenges in, in trying to bring together a service management program that we had to face. So we created uh, a service management competency center where we invited uh, people from different parts of the business, from the School of Public Health, from the School of Medicine, um, within our own IT department uh, that supported key areas and functions. Uh, to, to come together and uh, provide, uh, be champions for service management, and provide guidance and kind of govern the use of our, our tool and our processes. Um, we created formal roles that eventually uh, were embedded into our job family system around process ownership and service ownership and being process managers. Um, we've created process champions for knowledge management. We want you to be a knowledge champion. Um, we've developed a project management community of practice where we share um, battle stories and best practices and, and what it means to do a risk assessment and how that can um, be you know, implemented within small project teams or large project teams. So a lot of great formal initiatives around training awareness and creating roles. And all of this is also very much public. So um, another little URL for you would be to check out what we've done with our, our service management competency center by going to smcc.emory.edu. Awesome. Thanks, Barb. OK, so now we're going to talk about socializing value, uh, my favorite part. Uh, <laughs> OK, so what is socializing value? It's really about two things. It's about making sure the business understands the value of IT. That's talked about a lot. But it's also making sure that IT understands the value that the business provides and then back up that the business knows that IT understands the value that the business provides. So I want to ask you today, do you know what uh, is going on in the social space at your organization? Do you know how the business is communicating to the public or internally about the value they're providing? Uh, this slide here shows an example of all the different ways that different schools here are, are communicating value through social means. Uh, if you uh, go out to Facebook, you can find most of these schools also there or on Twitter. They have accounts there that they're actively involved with the community and with, uh, with each other. We need to make sure that IT is participating in those conversations, that IT knows uh, what those uh, outcomes are, what they're talking about, and responds and uh, 
not this. This slide here talks about IT metrics for IT metrics sake. This is this is typical what you see organizations doing is um, talking about how many emails they're delivering or how many spams they're filtering out or how many uh, you know text messages are being sent. These numbers don't really mean anything when it comes to outcomes and value. So we got to get past this. We got to get to a point where that value that the business is pro is providing belongs to IT and the business together. Um, so I encourage you to think about. Uh, like, let's take Twitter for example. Hashtags for your company or your organization. Uh, the Twitter accounts for your company or your organization. It shouldn't just be marketing or someone who's responsible for those accounts that's monitoring and, and uh, looking at the activity that's going on. That can belong to everyone. So get more and more people involved in, in looking at those communications and participating in those communications. It could be every single person in your organization that is involved in that. Um, so again, looking at I just got to interrupt you because this next piece, okay. this next piece, folks, this is where the money's at right here, and you didn't even have to pay anything to be on this twenty-four hour conference because I I love this concept and I don't know why we haven't thought of this sooner. So now that I've really built that up, <laughs> have Adder. Thank you, Farah. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before, I work in configuration management a lot, and this is a typical model for a CMDB. You have your infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Cha ching. Thank you. <laughs> this is a typical model for a CMDB. You have uh, the infrastructure and all the CIs uh, that support services, the applications. And then services is usually the top tier CI that everything rolls up to. But if you ask yourself, what are these services actually doing? What are the outcomes of these services? Do you know? Uh, we have, for example, research services here at Emory. Um, and that's great when we can see, you know, that the work we're doing in IT supports a research service. But what is research doing with that service? Are they working on a vaccine that will end up saving, you know, thousands of lives? That's important to know. Who's actually participating in and receiving those outcomes and, and, and what is the feedback back from them? So these are all business outcomes that I, I believe you could create CIs for. They're, in a way, temporary CIs that you can... Uh, create relationships to. So if, if you've got an engineer and he's going to replace a network switch at a location, he should be able to know what, what actual outcomes are uh, impacted by that outage and that he's helping to restore. He should be able to give, to get uh, customer feedback on, uh, you know, routed to him through CMDB relationships. Here's an exa uh, some examples of the different types of business outcomes you could actually create CIs for individual customer experiences or testimonials could be created as CIs. That could be Pinterest pictures, that could be videos that they're putting on YouTube. Why not attach those to CIs and make sure that the people who are working on the, the components further down can participate in that value through those relationships. And really what you're looking at there is a, a full social value network. And, and this is how it rolls up. So you've got your business value, that turns into community value or social value, and then that comes down to the personal level for the employees and everyone who helps is part of that value chain to support those outcomes. This slide here shows you a uh, uh, kind of a picture of what a social value network could be and what, it, what we really want to strive for, and that's distribution of individual instances of outcomes and value uh, to everyone in IT and everyone in the business who supports uh, those services and the outcomes that they provide. So again, I encourage you to, to, to use what you have available to you uh, to spread the message of the value as you see it, take pictures, uh, write a blog, uh, just communicate whatever you can, make sure you're understanding and hearing the voice of your customers and what they're sharing, and all of that can be distributed in a, in a network to your uh, to your employees. 
So, so kind of building on that, uh, that socializing value, I think in order to socialize value, some of the challenges in some organizations uh, could be, well, do I really understand what I want that impact or that outcome to be? So I love to draw from this impact outcome model uh, because I think in IT we're very, very good at understanding and, and measuring that, hey, did we, did we take this uh, particular input um, to a program or a project? Did we actually perform the actions we said we would? Did we follow our change plan? Did we complete the upgrade? Um, so those are, we, we talk in terms of immediate short-term outcomes, right? We upgraded the application, we've patched our server, we've uh, complete, completed what we said we would, uh, you know, we get a little bit of that immediate feedback through even artifacts such as the post-implementation review after a change. Um, in the major incident review after you've had a, a really bad thing happen in your IT organization, after a major problem review. Um, and I think that, you know, service level management process, uh, you know, processes such as service level management kind of get a little closer to that, that long term where they look at how have we performed over a quarter or over a period of time. But I think we need to become better at understanding what are those long term impacts and how can we come back and measure those? So um, one key artifact that has a lot of these answers, uh, if written well, can be your business case. The business case tells you what the problem I'm having, why I need the solution or a solution for something, what the impact of having this problem in place is. So if that's the case, and that's already defined in our business case, then can we not use that information to then measure, all right, now what is the impact um, long term of having completed this project or seeing this through um, realization and going back and saying did we eliminate those impacts? Did we achieve the net new impact we wanted to? Uh, so we started along that journey and PMBOK, an, another great practice and body of knowledge from a project management perspective, um, asks for a post-project review. So heck, we created one and we've just started to do these that are 90 days after our go live. And what we try to do through these post-project reviews is go, okay, if the business outcome that was defined in the business case was to improve working processes, um, did we actually do that after, you know, at go live and then 90 days after, was it sustained? Um, one of the things that we walk away with um, at the close of a project as a part of our organizational change management strategy is what we call an OCM roadmap where we provide inputs and observations that happen throughout the project and say to the new serv the service owner um, that here's what we think you need to do to sustain this change, sustain the behaviors that you need to be able to utilize this service or upgraded part of a service um, appropriately and see that long-term impact. So definitely um, I think it's important to go, what is that long-term impact? And, and let me frame it for you in another way. How awesome is it if you can say from an analytics perspective um, that we've done something, we've implemented this project and now we can see that 10 years down the road that particular student um, has through their education landed a job um, in the field of their study. Or through analytics we've given a student insight into how likely they are to succeed or pass or fail their course. So there's interesting things that we can do and it's about understanding what is the desired impact we have and creating measures to look at those more long term. I think another um, big piece around sustaining value is around how we frame what we are doing. Um, what was interesting is, you know, Mark mentioned um, having the luxury of the almost 3,000 wireless ports. But you wouldn't believe the challenge it was to get there, or maybe you would, and you can relate. Um, but one of the things that we worked on this last year was to getting rid of our wired ports um, inside of the residence halls and uh, dorms and dorms, uh, and completely turning them uh, wireless. And you know, we did get our fair share of interesting hate mail, and I can't let go of my wired port, and you know. The, the whole hugging the wired port um, piece and we, we had fun with uh, reading those emails but what was interesting is those concerns and emails and all of that input and, and the news, uh, newspaper um, press that we got 
was to ensure that we really took the right steps to make this a success. We communicated the change to the students. We you know, ensured that we had an alternative way for them to get a wired port if they really needed one, um, though we would bill them for it. Um, we had to establish trust with our student community that, you know what, our wireless service will be there for you because um, that was important to them. You know, we gave the students exactly what they wanted and we understood all they care about was a highly reliable wireless network. Why? So they can, you know, study for their exams, they can check on their courses, they can download material, they can interact with other students, interact with their um, professor, or unwind and play an Xbox game or watch a Hulu program or whatever it may be. Um, but it was really understanding what they wanted, understanding their fears, um, understanding what their desired outcomes were, and designing towards that. So um, that was very, very important and, and a great uh, success story for us. Um, and so I guess in order to conclude around sustaining value, um, I, I would say it's knowing your business. And not not just saying that in the context of know your business, yeah, we deliver research and healthcare, or um, it's about really knowing that business. Uh, you know, a lot of people say it's, it's easier to see what you do when you're in public service or when you're non-for-profit and, and all of that, but I'll, I'll take an energy or utilities example. Um, so when you've got, uh, you're providing or your company is providing power or water um, or these utilities, well, when SCADA systems go down and there could be a flaw in one of the processes that treats the water, um, that's huge. And whatever part of the business that you're in in IT, if you're going to be supporting those systems, knowing that that's what you're maintaining can be that difference rather than viewing it as, oh, I'm just helping their stocks inflate and, and make some few executives money. And it's amazing how much you know that can make a difference in how you do your work and what you execute. Uh, at Emory, knowing our business means that it's not just about students receiving education. It's about students um, getting to their goals, graduating. It's about students um, you know, getting into a career in the field of their choice, uh, potentially even then um, you can take it further and say the long-term impacts of that good education leads to them building and having a good family and another generation of kids will then also go to university and get a good education. It has economical impacts in terms of um, really gaining that economic lead and, and being um, okay financially. It's not just about research. It's about researching um, to provide support or develop an application that can help provide a breakthrough in the next cure for AIDS or cancer. Um, it's not just about providing a virtual classroom, but it's about education to people um, that may not have had access to that education before, um, improving their quality of life. You know. Um, it's not just about saving that patient's life. That patient could be the breadwinner for that particular family that he's a, a part of. And making sure that he is OK or she is OK um, could be the difference in how they lead their lives. So um, in terms of what we do here, we want to create, deliver, socialize, and sustain value so that um, here at Emory, we can help be a small part of uh, improving the quality of life of all the individuals that we impact. So that's that. I had to let you just sit there for a minute and, and, and bask in it. <laughs> so certainly one of the more impactful presentations today, um, a lot a lot a lot a lot on Twitter um, uh, just to catch you up because I know you've been busy actually presenting um, <laughs> something that jumped out at me and I'm, people will say I, I purposely chose this question uh, and avoided everything else I just read but you didn't mention your service desk tool once <laughs> it doesn't matter what the tool is <laughs> uh, 
Um, what do you, I mean, there are going to be a lot of people out there who watch this presentation today, tomorrow, and in the future, um, who are going to get so many, uh, so much real, real world knowledge from this, you know, can they contact you? I mean, and this is, this is oh, a big deal. Absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, that's one thing I think we, we're good at here at Emory and most universities is being pretty public about about things and sharing. So our contact information is out there. Tweet us, whatever you whatever you want to do. We're always willing to spend time. And and I I like to also add, you know, these things, uh, providing social value, that's that's something any company can do. It's something that uh, there's always something you can do better. There's always something your company can do to impact the world in a better way, whether it's just cleaner or cheaper so people have more money in their pocket or just improving the quality of life through the quality of your product. There's always something you can do. You just have to ask, why are we, why are we doing this? So that what? So. Yeah. Um, there's actually an ISO standard, uh, ISO 38500. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but uh, it's about responsibility, strategy, uh, performance, uh, conformance, and human behavior. So it's a, it's a whole conditioning of, of that sort of thing. Uh, what types of things do you use to measure your success? I mean, a, a skeptic could watch your presentation and go, oh, that's, they got lots of flashy stuff, but, you know, I personally feel with the problem with, with IT is not any of the things we've talked about today. It's we're using wooden rulers for starships. Um, what are you guys using? Well, I think it's, it's interesting that you say that because I think in many ways we're just on the very, very beginning of this journey in doing that. And we struggle with those same challenges where we have um, people that don't even understand uh, why there is value in going mobile, um, that are, are have those fears, right? And you mean so, like getting up and walking around and like not, not mean, getting what your BMI? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we've started down that journey of going, uh, you know, we, we've been discussing how do we measure the value that we are bringing by being more social and being out there? I mean, is it doing the right thing for us? Um, but I'll tell you some, some interesting stories in my personal experience here is that I've been able to open up and, and my value proposition now is that rather than me just being the expert here delivering information, I'm delivering information from other experts that I've networked with that can make the product that I have to deliver that much better. And so, you know, whether that's through the ITSM tool that we use and how we can utilize it to be more efficient or whether that's through what metrics I choose for the post-project review um, so that we can look at long-term impacts beyond the project close. Uh, I think these are things that are beginning to start um, to help us along our journey. And I'll give another shout out to Ian Clayton and, and Ken Gonzalez in, in the whole outside in view with uh, Universal uh, Service Management and USM Bach. I mean, it's exactly what we need. It's, it's a fresh perspective. Um, that, <laughs> that that that's the new uh, outside in sound. Whenever yeah, someone mentions Ian Clayton, we've got <laughs> very nice, very nice. So I think we're you know I haven't necessarily answered your question, and that's because I'm still I think learning on what we do to measure, and I think we. But the fact is, you're questioning your measurement. I don't care yeah. that you're not answering it. I care that you realize you don't have the tools or the concepts to measure it. And I, I mean, think, before we knew to measure sunlight, we just looked at it. Right. Every company needs to be thinking about this because it's not just about revenue. It's not about EBITDA. It's, it's about value. And yeah, you, you may not know how to measure that, but someone has to agree that you've provided value and then you have. And, and that adds to your bottom line, whether you like it or not, it does. So you guys obviously are pretty progressive. I have to ask you, because you go to conferences and you go to events and all sort user groups and this whole idea of TFT and mixing video and presentations and speakers and getting people in different languages and different concepts. I mean, I value your opinion. Uh, tell me it's just amazing. It is amazing. <laughs> Anything else we can call it? <laughs> oh, it's just the, it's just the beginning. It's gonna be it's gonna be really exciting to see where it goes from here. Yeah. That's, that's the world is only getting smaller, and these mediums are proving it to be true. Right? I mean, the the power of knowledge is in how a community comes together. So this expands the community to a global stage, unlike no other. And I think that's huge because 
Um, we sometimes are restricted by our knowledge because of experiences that we may have had or can share within the confinements of North America. But, you know, it could be completely different from what people have experienced and gone through in the UK. And I think the more we know, the more we grow. I'm sounding all cliche, but um, boy, is it interesting to hear some of the sh stories and ideas that come from Europe. And you gain, you gain, for example, or Australia. And you gain just a whole new sense of, of I guess, respect and, and understanding. And, and it's almost humbling because you realize how much there is still to learn. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, people always use that expression, it might be a cliche, but the one thing I've noticed about cliches is when they come from the heart, they're the most honest things you can say. And a cliche said by one person versus another, you, know, you can just, you can tell when it's a cliche. And I didn't, I didn't read any cliche in that. Um, we've got Rob England coming up next. Uh, are you guys familiar with the IT skeptic? Oh, you bet, this should be exciting. Yep. Yeah, standard I, plus case, is that what he's doing? Uh, he's doing standard plus case, and I'm sure he'll do a little bit of a, you know, he's got to get a little skep in there. <laughs> um, he's one of these people that has a lot of different opinions. Where do you guys go when you're looking for opinions and, and information? Where do you get your sources of innovation except out of, you know, divine influence, apparently? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I'm all over the place, but Twitter is is a big part of my life, and and it's interesting to talk to people who haven't really gotten into Twitter, but Twitter has really changed my life. I mean, it's it's extended my my team to to the whole world, and it's it's people I can pull in for different reasons for different things whenever I need them. Uh, there's also the Facebook group uh, back to ITSM. There's so much going on yeah. there that uh, you can anyone really can pose a question and have the world's best experts give their honest and, and really open feedback. And that's just, that's something you couldn't do even 10 years ago, you know? Well, I have a little secret for you. Uh -oh. You guys are one of those world's best experts. Oh, thank you, Chris. <laughs> thank you, Chris. <laughs> okay, well, uh, be well. Thank you for sharing. We'll be back in 10 minutes with uh, probably uh, uh, one of the uh, people enjoy watching and consuming uh, at, a, at a level that's uh, pretty uh, unreal, uh, and that would be the IT skeptic. So uh, thank you, Farah uh, and Mark, and have a great day. Thank you. You as well. Bye-bye.